<laughs> I, I would like to uh, announce that we have somebody here to talk, a person who is widely known as driving every politician absolutely nuts and out of the country, actually. So we applaud him wildly. And, and this is what happens when you put Ann and I together oh, with a couple of other people, including right here, Cliff, and um, and I know the video's running, and I know better than to say something in the middle of it that's going to end up where you don't want it. And you can ask the president of the Farm Bureau what a big mistake he made recently. But five years ago, I retired, and I came here, and we were talking with somebody about it a few minutes ago. He said, you were talking about solving some problems. And, and you know, I, I'm the third choice tonight, and I've been working on this. So, anyway, yeah, third, third. I'm actually the third. I can actually name him if you want. But uh, they, they just didn't want to go out public right now. I don't understand why, particularly in Plymouth and Bristol County. But anyways, um, don't blame them. The, uh, so, what I came here and said was, in, in five years ago, I retired, and I was, it was the, 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 I retired on a Saturday, the end of the week, and came here and spoke on a Wednesday, and I was wondering what I was going to do the rest of my life. You don't have any time once you retire, and I'll let everybody in this room know that. Uh, but what I, what I said I was going to do is, we were losing about 90% of the bees then. Bristol and Plymouth and other people I associate with, you know, that's a, that's a big number. And I said, well, maybe I'm going to go out and join Facebook. I hated Facebook. The whole concept of Facebook back then was just awful. It's the handiest tool in the world now, but it was really awful. And so I, I, I signed up and I started looking for people. You know, people still bees alive. Uh, people whose bees died, particularly those that are alive. And I went there and said, well, what did you, you, what did you treat your bees with? Where did your bees come from? What do they look like? Uh, are they carnies? Are they this? Are they that? And I had worked as an APR inspector, and I'll go through this in a couple minutes, uh, for five years as chief APR ins inspector my last year because of the number of politics that were taking place because of the mites coming into the state. And I probably won't go into any depth in that with the camera running tonight. But anyway, so what really went on. And, I'm, you know, and that's why I'm here tonight. I had a chance to put all this together. I can show you what we do. Uh, we're losing less than 3 or 4% in the Bristol area where I am, the people I work with. And so, so, you know, I got some ideas. You don't have to listen to them, but I, you know, I put this together and, and such. And, you know, we still, I got to get out of your way. Uh, that was the best place to get out of your way over here. Is so, percent of your hives every year? That's we wouldn't do it. We're, we're, that's all that's dying, if not less. We got a group, and I'm not supposed to talk about hive hoppers. It's a group where I used to go out, and the first thing I did was I started the club. They didn't say whatever they want. She's making fun of me now. Anyways, the, um, so what, what I did when I originally went out, I'd call somebody and say, Can I come over your house? And you know, your bees are alive, and I want to look at them. Okay, I'll go to the house, look at the bees. They'd be inspected for a million years. And I go, Okay, you know, what'd you do different? Well, the next day I'd go to someone else's house, and now two people would call and want to go with me. So we started hive hopping. And there's a whole group of people where I went out, and we just went to people. I, this people up here I visited, they're not here tonight, so I won't mention who they are. And there's a bunch of people up here I visited during that period, too, to see what was going on everywhere. Uh, by, you know, I get, <coughs> then I'll get to who I am. Uh, so for me, this was, this was fun. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a scientist. I have publications in insect viruses. So you can see where this is probably going to go and such. And, and, so, and anyway, back here. The monarch butterfly, you know, I took this one this summer. I mean, they're still around, not gone yet. Um, they're threatened. You know, I'm going to tell you today, right in this room, that there's problems. Uh, some things there may not be, but there is. And this is this is a thistle, a, a, yeah, thistle, a teasel, and such. And it's a nice plant. That's basically who I am. And I can see it from here. And so if I'm an entomologist, I run my own LLC now. And this tonight's the 23rd. I hope, and I hope I got that right. Uh, I've been here probably in the late 70s, in, in, in either been speaking here that long and such. But here's who I am. I threw some of this together. Uh, this has been coming up a lot. And certainly I went to UMass Amherst, got my bachelor's degree, Iowa State in entomology. Uh, I started uh, beekeeping in 1975 in Iowa. I was a graduate student there. And they offered the course as an undergraduate course, so I couldn't take it for credit. Maybe I should go to the back behind everybody. I can speak from there just as well. Yeah, but, you know, but then people like looking at faces. So anyways, the, um, so I started beekeeping then, and I got back here around uh, 19, uh, I came back about 70, graduated in 76, so I took the bee class at Bristol from Fred McGee in 1977. 
And before the class was even over, I was out teaching the bacteria, the spalbrood, and all that with him. So I went around with him for 10 years or so, and speaking to all the bee groups for years and years and years. So I you know, got 100 hours of teaching. Uh, I was an apiary inspector from 86 to 90, which were the most craziest years that existed because we got the mites in, we had tracheal mites show up, on and on and on. Political things, the, the chief inspector getting thrown out of the job because they didn't like what he did, and they didn't realize that was going to be worse than him. And fun things like that. Uh, and, yeah, so I was acting chief inspector, and I do, uh, I'm an adjunct instructor of uh, beekeeping at Bristol Community College. And it's, it's you know, fairly, fairly, they, they're getting this, you, you're getting the same one I gave there last, yesterday. So I've been practicing this one and, and putting it together because I wanted to you know, put it together and I needed to do it. It's the same old agriculture group down there. So here I am, and trying to talk about some of the things I brought, brought together. And this is one of the things I throw at my students and they go, what do you mean? And I just can explain to you what, what I mean by this. Nosema apis is the nosema you all know about. You know, it's the same one. I can tell you it's circular in shape and everything. And Noma, uh, Nosema serranier is a new, so it's a new Nosema. It's an intestinal parasite. It probably aggravates viruses that got into the country almost universally in 1990. There's a lot of ways they've done this. They've been looking at it, and this is a major problem for a lot of reasons, mainly because it enhances viruses in the honeybees. So we're going to talk about some other things. So can you guys still see? Yeah, we're fine. Yeah, we're fine. Can we do something? Okay, now the right um, so, there's been some interesting things that's happened with this. If you notice the name Apis serrana, it's an Asian honeybee. And this is a native one with it. That, that is the Nosema it has, you know, this, the new one. Well, someplace, probably in the Philippines, they guess, it hopped over into our honeybees, which is this European one right here, and, and, and stuff right here. Which is the European dock bee, the German, uh, the German bee came over in 1644. People know when the bees came into this country, that's the first set that came on. And the Econica here. And I'm going to talk more about this, but what we had is within our bees in the United States was a major shift in 1990. Anybody has been keeping bees during that period can remember how well your bees did during that period, probably, probably as well as mine did. They can go back molecularly and look at bees, bees that, that, that stored up and stuff, uh, and things going on, but this is... A piece of it. And those who have a camera, welcome to take pictures. I've convinced my ki kids in my class to go, and now they, so why are you going to write and you all have cameras in your hands? You know, you know, send your emails and everything. I don't really care. But anyways, it's, uh, you know, most of them don't, don't spend time listening to other things. So I'm going to just start off with, a, how many people think this is a honeybee? It's that question you got. Okay. Think it's a honeybee? Who knows what it is? It's a that, well, you've probably heard me talk before, no? You knew that one? That is a squash bee, and it's in a zucchini. And it's neat, because they uh, have a very short life cycle, they only work squash. There's actually one for blueberries, uh, very similar to that. And it got that flower, and that flower is it. It is not going to share that flower with anything else that goes in the world, it's, it's flower. And it's going to close up at night like zucchini do, and it's going to stay in there for several days eating and well protected. So I'm taking you through the fun stuff now. <laughs> You'll be taking a lot of notes in a few minutes. But it's a cool thing. You put some zucchini in, you give it to your next door neighbors when you get a million of it, and when they're going away on vacation, you put it on the front steps. That's a New England tradition. You guys haven't heard that one online. Yeah, okay. You know, how are you going to eat 30 pounds of squash? I like watching this for, for the little bees. Well, there's a bubble bait, and there's a species name on them, uh, that decided it, it, it was going to go in there. And the two of them are just angry at each other, and it, it's, I call it minors, but, it, but, the, uh, but that particular little bee, and it flashes those white things at it, tell them to get out. It says, no, nope, you're sharing this with me today. And it's really funny watching the two of them struggling. And the bumblebee, you know, leaves, goes to her nest, and the other one, the female in this case, stayed, and stayed in the flower. Everybody got along really fine. Let's say a few things about who, who can guess what a cuckoo bee is. A lot of them, there's a lot of them around. And what they are is like, you know, they, they switch an egg with a lot of insects, and these are all, this looks like a bumblebee. They probably grew up in a bumblebee nest. It smells like one, looks like one, could even be a fly, it might even be a fly looking at it. But it grew up in there, and that's cuckoo. They go in there, live with them, and there's a lot of species of cuckoo bees. You know what's happened when you, when, when you lose a main species? You're losing two or three other species. 
That's happening in England. It's been well documented now, particularly the bumblebees and the cuckoo bees. So a lot of these things look like hornets and wasps. They may only be flies. Um, but this is just, these are very, very easy to find. They're wonderful, wonderful creatures to look at. Yeah, this is what's running around the dandelion in my yard. I think that, I'm pretty sure that's just a fly, and it does look like a hornet, doesn't it? Now, would you run up? I didn't grab it. I, you know, even that, I know it isn't. I'm still going to grab it. Yeah, but that's what they look like. They look like other things, and it gives it a lot of protection. You know, if you're that, other things aren't going to eat them that, that don't like them. Here's, some cra here's another crazy monster. It, I know it's a, a cuckoo fly, and they just love dandelion. And they, you can find these things all the time in your backyard. It's a lot of fun. So they're laying eggs and other... Yeah, other yeah, things. yeah. They're not solitary. They found either a miner in the ground or something to put it, and they have chemical smells, so they don't have the ability. This is, the thing is, the point I'm making is about England, really. It, it's, for every bumblebee they're losing, they're losing two or two or three. Mm -hmm. And that's been well documented there. I don't know if we've had that big a hit, but we must have don't have people studying as close as that. Well, this is along the Chicago River I was visiting, and there's some flowers along the bank, and this is, you know, typical Italian, you know, it's kind of nice. <laughs> Beautiful walkway down there, and it's well planted by the, by the city. So you know, I'm I'm pretty bored there. My, I think my wife is at a library conference, and, and so I wasn't going to go to that. And uh, so I'm out taking pictures of the bees, enjoying myself. It's got a nice white pollen, and you know, here's a carny. You know, another flower down. So there's starting to be some changes in, in the dynamics of the bees. You know, we're starting to get a lot more dark bees. I'm one of those that goes out there, and you know, you look. And if you're looking at some of um, Renee Barton's Sylvanian stuff. This is what all, they're required to have bees like that in this country. She's been working with the, with the hives there, and she's been over there for four or five weeks, at least, and bringing stuff back and forth. See, I'm going to pin you down with the camera. <laughs> and anyways, but this, this, this is all you see, that's all they're allowed to have there. It's the government said so they don't have the other disease problems. So they have that advantage, they have a lot less chemicals there, and I could go on and on and on about that, but that's a topic for another night. But, you know, that's what you see. And this is supposed to be a 13-spotted beetle, and, and I haven't yet found where the 13 spot is. I mean, I'm an entomologist, and I'm 12. I still think it's 12. Maybe there's a spot on the bottom. I don't know. But anyways, it, it's a lot of cool stuff out there if you look at look at so many insects in the world. And this is related to me. It's a miner. One of one climbs in the ground. And so there's a lot of pollinators out there. Somebody's using pesticides indiscriminately. It, there's a lot of things to kill. And they are. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind about it. Um, we still have stuff. Um, some areas of the country have it, you know, not in as good shape as we are, but because we don't know about bumblebee and redbud, and if anybody gets any of the posts man right now, she's saying the redbuds are all in bloom down where she is in the, the area she's in. It, it is gorgeous because it just, mine's not blooming yet, but the whole mountainsides look pink. And you can see how this bumblebee, and this is a queen, this one just got through, through the winter. It's probably not a couple weeks before mine flower. My honeybees don't go near it. I, I don't, yeah, the bumblebees like it better. You're right. They, yeah, I see them now and then, but you're absolutely right. The bumblebees prefer it. And this is probably a species that they adapted to. I mean, the bumblebees aren't invasive in the United States, but honeybees are. So honeybees are going to prefer the invasive plants like linden. You know, so, you know, that's, it's kind of interesting. But it's fun to start watch. Do you say that's a queen? That would be a queen because this is really early in the spring. She would have overwintered as individual queens. Winter over, and then they build a nest. Usually, move into a mouse nest, and when they're in the mouse nest, they start laying eggs, and she'll take care of the first bunch of workers that come off. Would you and they produce their own. The queen like that? That, that queen, you could probably cage that into something if you could get it far enough away from where it's probably already set up. It's collecting uh, pollen. I doubt that's for itself. So there's, there's a. They probably moved into an old mouse nest, and that's where they live. Uh, they, they reproduce. They're going to get just, just, you know, basically workers. That as we get into August, they start switching over to you know real queens, real drones, and they mate. And it's very similar to what we have, but they spend they spend the winter by themselves, usually under a rock, mouse nest, but usually in a pile of rocks. And you can watch them if you're watching in the spring. You can watch them going to a place in a field, and there's probably a, a a mouse nest there. So you can actually go up. They're not that bad. You can go up and actually look at them um, and stuff. They'll tolerate it to a point. And stuff, but they're a lot of fun too. What's next? Okay, we got we got another queen up here, a blueberry. There's actually a, a, a blueberry, you know, one 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 of one like like the the other one earlier. Um, it's um, B, and it's you don't see very many of them, but once in a while I, I do do see them. But boy, go look at the early stuff. There's you know, it maybe not much longer. I mean, these were taken three or four years ago. I can still find these. 
but it's a good way to monitor what's happening at your house. I don't think I live in a, in a really amazingly big neonic area. I live near huge swamps. And there's not a lot of neonics in those places. And the big trees which are flowering, the silver maples and stuff probably don't have it. And it's the, it's the yard stuff that where you're going to be picking up a lot of neonics in particular. But in this case, I don't think I have a lot. Now, I do have some serious pesticide problems in my house, and many people probably see that foray I've gone into two or two or three times now. But anyways, we'll talk about that at the end. Ants? Really, really good pollinators. Ant B. Well, that one, that one is really ant. I, I, yeah, ant B. Is, uh, I was looking, I'm double checking right now, now that I said that, to make sure the body parts are lined up. Um, Cal Ford fly. Now, Cal Ford, you know the dog droppings all over you? All over you. And the, and the flies, the green flies that come to it and lay eggs on it and stuff. That's this one that's working some sumac. It needed some sugar. What can I tell you? It's a funny, it's a funny little little creature, but it's a Cal Ford. Uh, greenish looking and it's amazing how many things use things like sumac which in my house doesn't have any neonics in it I mean it's, I, I got much worse things around me a forward fly this is very closely related I suspect to the one that's being released for the winter moth which we have winter moth and gypsy moth in my area total defoliation. I don't know how you guys did up here probably as bad as we did and uh, for us down our way though that meant that the most of the leaves got taken off and I remember back in the olden days when I kept these, when we had big gypsy moths, we had huge pepper bush flows. Leaves are gone, droppings and fertilizer, sun and rain. Most people in my area on a new hive did over 100 pounds of pepper bush this year. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very good year down in our area because of that. This is a far fly. Oh, it's just, this is probably, I don't, think, I don't think this is a mimic. I think this is probably one of the ectomonids that, that are getting. But so many things need nectar. I mean, that's the point I'm trying to make here. There's a variety of things out here, and there could be a lot of damage going on. If there aren't people out taking pictures, if there aren't people out doing counts, you don't know what's going to happen. And it's just, it's just another type of wasp. I mean, it's not the types you thought existed. I mean, have everybody ever seen one of these before? That's the first one I've ever seen. And no, there's a lot of stuff that could be damaged out there in the world. The uh, illicits are there. There are a lot around. There's this green one. It's... Um, <coughs> It's fun. It, it seems to be doing well. You know, the other advantage they do have is they don't fly as far. Maybe it's a quarter or half a mile. Maybe a big bumblebee could go a mile. So they're not going out the range. And I'll talk about that in a minute that the, that the honeybees go. And here we have a different type of miner up here and a housefly. Houseflies are pollinating. Who would have thought? A lot of other pollinators out there. What we do in... in um, Bristol County is we have these packages we hand out, and I have it with me this time, and it's a bee mix, and, and we get a really good price from Johnny's, and we, we can't pass it around and see what it looks like. Um, we actually get a lot of it and give it away at meetings. I bet you we've given a thousand packages of that away. But here's, here's what we did with it. And we went like this, and we, we, we gave people a nice car, pollinator. We got a really good deal from Johnny's with what we were doing. We were breaking into small packages. They helped us with labeling and stuff. And this is what it looks like. I mean, the bees are solid. It came up the second year. As good as the friend, you have to put any more in. Look at the flowers you've got. You know how many bees? Do they like it? Well, look at it. You'll see it in a minute. California poppy, they really like it. It's unbelievable. It's really inexpensive. Club should get some and give somebody an ounce of it or something. And, and I just did a three feet by three feet area with that package and such. And so you got a bunch of beetles that think this is the coolest thing in the world. But we're killing beetles if we're not using pesticides correctly as well. This is really a service, and it's, um, it's, it's kind of having some fun. And it and a honeybee aren't getting along, but it's pretty obviously the honeybee won this struggle because it ran to the edge. So the honeybee won this one. They, they, didn't, they don't like getting that close to them. And they can have a couple. Once again, I run mostly carnies in my backyard. I think it's Italian here. I think I get some mixed, but um, they, yeah, they do, I think they do quite a little bit better. And this thing is so small you can't even see it. I mean, I couldn't even blow it up more. I'm just making a point. I want to continue to make it. There's a lot of pollinators out there that can be damaged that are incredibly important. Including mosquitoes. Mosquitoes actually do very well here, and I can get off into mosquitoes. I'm a mosquito expert too. Usually, you guys ask me to do TikToks when I walk in. I mean, that happened to me I looked two times ago. So, could you really talk about ticks for a few minutes? And I did. <laughs> I could have had some slides if I'd known ahead of time. That could be a talk for another day. Well, who knows what this is? Come on. I hope it hasn't been gone so long that no one remembers. Well, people still remember what it looks like. Back about 1985, the, you know, the, the, our, our good friends at Audubon decided they, they wanted this gone. 
They released a bunch of insects, and this is a, this is a honey from beekeepers. You'd get 50, 60 pounds during that bad area in the time in late June going into July. Gone. And you wonder why we start having bee problems. Gone. And, and they, so it's beginning to come back. And actually, there's so much coming back in Rhode Island that people are getting a slight surplus on it in Rhode Island from my area south. Uh, so it's, for me, it's great. Because I was the one when Audubon did this. I said, well, why don't we all cut down the lindens next? Because that's an invasive species, too. And the Norway maple. Don't, don't even get me started. Oh, I bet you we can all go like that. Really? You know, what happened? And when I explain to my, 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 my classes, I go, now, 1644, well, the bees just couldn't go over here. So we planted almonds, apples, and the bees, and the whole habitat changed. Dandelions, planting. Yep. <laughs> You can come up here too. You know, really, I, <laughs> that you know, I try. And then I have much, much longer slides about that. <laughs> and but you, our biggest honey flows are from the invasives. <clears throat> Some of the best essential oils come out of linden. It's amazing what they have, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that shortly because this is some of the treatments we down in Bristol use now. Uh, we have a lot of herbalists with us, and they convinced me to start looking at some of these things and, and what other people have done in research. And I'm going to get into that. So you can see it. Well, I, I thought this was great. I mean, and there's some actually some sumac coming back in there. Why yeah. did it disappear? Why did they disappear? Oh, they, they, they let a beetle go to <clears throat> wipe it out. Oh, because I used to have tons of it. Well, now you know where it went. <laughs> but it's coming back. And I don't know whether the beetles shifted or whether the plants shifted. You know, there could have been a, you know, there's people that do that kind of genetic I've been trying to grow some of that stuff and it's finally starting to come in. It's so, taking take me about 10 years, but I'm getting some... Well, I, I can't find that beetle. I've been looking at stuff like that and I've been, I know what it looks like. I studied it at the time and I haven't been able to find the beetle. And of course, remember, Audubon, legitimately, from their standpoint, do not like honeybees and will not support them, will not allow them on the reservations. They're invasive, and they feel they're taking out other bees. I can understand that. It, it's a good, it's, you know, I can understand their argument. It doesn't mean I'll agree with them, and I won't say bad things about linden trees and not cutting them down, but, but still, I understand where they're coming from. You know, they don't, you know, we want more for our natural pollinators, our normal pollinators, and they, you know, most of their reservations are, you know, within four or five miles of the bee, so that's another thing, yeah. I didn't hear what that, what is that? Purple loose strife. Purple loose stripe. It grows like this, and this is the best, biggest patch I've seen in 20 years. I don't know if anybody else probably agrees with me that follows this kind of stuff. Come, come ride the train with me down through Hingham and Cohasset. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is. This, this, this is next to a mall. But the thing is, in Rhode Island, you know, some I, I, the characteristic taste, the color, and the smell that comes in that period. Someone said, "Watch this," and I went, "You're near loose stripe." I've seen a little bit in mine, but you know, it has a different sheen. It's got that oil sheen. Yeah, People remember what, remember what the oil the oil looks like? Well, it looks like you've got oil in your jar, <coughs> and you turn it, it looks like oil. That's what its honey looks like. It's about that color, too. It tastes great. It's a totally different tasting, but it, it, it's a really... You know, little hits like this along the way haven't helped us very much. Not the biggest hit. I'll get into the big hits when I get to the depressing stuff in a few minutes. Uh, Russian olive. That's my, that's my biggest producer in my area. It is everywhere. Uh, autumn olive, Russian olive, this is an invasive. It was brought in by USDA in 1955, 56. And what a fun, and you can smell this everywhere too. And it's June 15th as that's coming in. Big, I, I got, I actually got pepper bushes that, and I picked up about another 60 to 70 pounds on top of the 100 pepper bush. But I said 150 to 180 this year. A lot of us did. Brand new beekeepers. Brand new beekeepers, 120 in sold, 10 to $12 a pound. Big demand for honey in my area, too. You can do it. I mean, it's a matter of keeping your bees alive. And this is what the berry looks like from this. This is why one of the reasons the, you know, the, the, the federal government brought this in, and the ramens and some of those things. It sits. It's, people try to convince me, you soak it in alcohol and drink it, it tastes good. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, you just ruined some perfectly good vodka <laughs> and, and stuff. But I can see the, it, it's, it's one of those, it, it, some people make jellies with it now, right? particularly the Portuguese. This is very collectible because that's where the areas in the world where it comes from. And it's very, very popular in the Portuguese in my area uh, and, and stuff, that particular plant. And uh, pepper bush, most of you should know what that is. It's really strong. We've got a lot of it around here. You, get your bee, you can have your bees in shape by... 
you know, third week in July, you, you, if you treat your bees well in their packages, you should be able to get some honey. Never mind the people getting nukes, nooks, whichever part of the state you're in. So the tracheal mite was originally found in 1985 in Massachusetts. And it really did cause us a lot of problems. Uh, but, you know, those people are keeping bees for years. Think about these dates and where, where you're starting to get hit with stuff. Uh, tracheal mite's not really around anymore. There's so much, there's so much pesticides being used for Varroa. I haven't seen tracheal mite in 15 years. And, and, and oh, they're about, in the following winter, about 87, 88, we got about a 90% loss. So here's where the depressing ones start. And if anybody can tell, this is about five, about five years ago. And here's a hive, Taunton. Not in any particularly agricultural areas. Look at all that honey. There was another super honey, and that's all the bees that are left in October. No varroa on those. I don't know why. But that certainly is a puzzle. And as I explained to him, extract the honey. You know, the honey's worth, of, even then, the honey was worth a lot more than a package of bees. You know, people today, I go, yeah, extract your honey. Uh, it'll work well. I don't have an answer to this. Could it be a virus? I'm going to give you a whole list of things it could have been. Uh, but I truly don't know. And this is the first true one I ever saw. Where I went to the people's home and went, that's interesting. This so looks we had, like a super. It is. It's a medium super. Yeah. And with great honey here, they had obviously there's a lot of bees. Yeah, because I'm not seeing any brood area. No, brand new, brand new so, hive. Yeah. First year hive. The deeps had a lot of honey in them too, but the bees are gone. Well, this is the point. And you know, I pretty well have a pretty good idea what happened in the commercial people, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Why there's been so much C you know CCD. That one there, no dead bees in the front. The first thing I do, I go, yes, I look and see if there's dead bees laying in the front. No, I go, yeah. bone. no. well, why would the bees have died if it was honey? The bees are gone. Did they swarm? No evidence of swarming, no queen cells. Oh, the queen, back in the anyway, the queen's still in there. You see the picture here in a minute. What year? I'm going back about five years ago. Um, now this has been going on, but I got into retirement mode and had more time to do this kind of stuff then than I did before that. And there it is. Interesting picture. Is the queen still alive? Yep, she's right up there. She did die, and the whole group did die after about a month or so. But this is my slide where I'm bringing you into the unfortunate areas I'm going to be talking about. Queen died, laying on the entrance, died, Varroa. Row is the size of like a frisbee on your back, sucking your blood out of you. If you want to know about how that must be for a bee, I mean, obviously they can fly. They usually get under those plates. That one climbed out before I got the picture. And trachea mite like down in here. So, on a rural basis, and we're talking about viruses a lot more in a minute. It's amazing how these viruses are coming in the United States changed to match something from Europe, to match something from. China, match something from here. It's absolutely remarkable how that's happening. And I'll get in some of the theories on it, but I probably don't know for sure either. Well, we all know bee, you know, 50,000 bees can fly five miles. So bee can get itself into a lot of trouble. Collect a lot of honey too. But they can certainly get into stuff. This is a, something I use to count the number of dead bees in front of my hives. I do bee counts, and I'll talk about that before we get toward the end. And this is part of a, a, a study I'm doing, you know, I was doing at the time. So, Anybody that thinks they know the reason, this is, this is put together by the Europeans. And stress factors in honeybees. My, there's an awfully big list there. Unfortunately, the kids in the class have to work through each one of one, and they will have a question on any one in a closed book to write up what this is. But you can see the bee here. We're looking at different pesticides, techniques, farming practices, food supply, climate, and weather. We have big climate changes recently. Viruses, bacteria, uh, beekeeper practices. You know, the carasites and if they're the mites. Model of a lot of residues and everything and beneficial microbes we may not have. That is a very complicated thing. And we're all in agreement. Is it all of them? Is it one of them? What's it going to take to fix this? I don't have an answer. I will I have modules I talk about on these if people want to hear particular <coughs> ones, or I could just go in and talk about this individual one. That'll probably be what I do. It's the first time I've ever taught this course on uh, organic pest control at the college, so I probably will use the use as a principal slide as to how things can be damaged. Tracheomite. That's the, that, that little airway, they live in the airways in the tracheals, and that's about the size of a hair. One of the smallest things are. And we started getting our first virus hence then. 
without above. Matter of fact, one of the first ones found was in Massachusetts. Uh, with the, uh, one of the alcohol's inspector, and she's, um, she's she's a good friend of mine. It's funny, it's two of us that have been bee inspectors in the past, and it, it was fun, and she did it. So here's where I already want to go. This one, this one here, this one here is an interesting one. I, I'm trying not to I, see how I can not get in everybody's way. I, I could use I could use Ian's hammer at the point, but anyways, bee stock down in Louisiana makes sense. Obviously, they all go to almonds. Well, the rules changed a few years ago, around 2006. What the USDA said, well, there's no virus in New Zealand. So we can bring in New Zealand bees into there. That sounds pretty good. Sure. Into the almond pollination. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that does sound good in Mindy's. Sounds I'm not good. picking on any, I'm not picking on any particular person today. Yeah, fine Mindy's, yeah, all of them come there, and, and they lose a lot of bees every day. Don't think it's rosy for a migratory beekeeper. They probably lose 50 to 60 percent of the bees every year. They just don't want to talk about it, but they probably do. So we go out there, so okay, we got a bunch of these new bees in there, and everybody's getting their pollen, and man, they come usually back here. Some actually go try to pick up some honey up in the Midwest where they're with us honey. And they come into here. And come into Massachusetts. Da 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 da. And you, you can see the route. You know, it's kind of. So you, somebody brings them in, maybe somebody smuggles some bees in from South America, some Queens, and that's probably what's going on too. But look, look at that. I mean, it's. There's a lot of movement. It covers bees. the country. Things are coming in. They're being brought in in pockets. There's queens coming in. I'm sure from everywhere. I doubt Slovenia because they really have clean bees and they wouldn't be dying. But um, I, you know, I, it's certainly it's not legal to bring them in like that. It is legal if you want to do the permitting on it and, and, and all, all the other. But you know, we have that strain, and that's the Conica strain right there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. So, the following year, we had a hundred percent loss of every hive, because I was an inspector during this period, there was not a hive alive. Anywhere. So, okay, we're, we're getting a little note to check off here. We're going, okay, they're all gone. You know, I'm a science guy. Yeah, okay, what's going on here? This doesn't make any sense to me. Right there is the bro pitch I thought was next. And when they have a bad bunch of hives, the migratory guys, they just dump them someplace. When well, there's a little pile of bees down in here, and Al saw it a little quick. Al Carl saw it a little quicker than I did. So we went over there and looked in that hive and went, "Okay, well, it's you know, it's a, not a good hive. It's hidden from us, and you can't hide a hive from an apiary inspector, Partic particularly if you're hunting varroa, because it, it came up in Florida. We knew, and there was supposed to be some in Massachusetts. And we we're both advanced biology degree people. We really want to find this thing. So we went in there, right in there, and indeed we found varroa, the first varroa here in the United States." Oh, that uh, outside there. Yeah. We think it may have come down from Maine. We knew we knew who who the apiary group was. We know where they came from. We had been warned by Florida where they were. And it's amazing how fast they moved up. So we need alcohol, some containers, and that type of thing. So we go to the local companies back then, and we, we picked up all this isopropyl. And, and the clerk got the things. Now, don't you boys drink this? <laughs> no, no, man. We promise not to drink it. We just want to prefer, you know, preserve these mites because you know biology. This, you know. We both knew it was not a good sign. And basically it looked like about, we went out that winter doing surveillance and everything was lost that winter too. And, and so if we went out doing, doing surveillance and found that we had about two to three percent of the hives up to two miles had picked up Varroa from the hundred hives that came in. Yeah, not a lot. By the next year it was out five miles and all the hives within, the two, within that had we tried to treat everything in the area. We actually tried to treat with, at that point. The bees were dying, everything else. So it was kind of depressing. That's what the mite looks like. Um, probably not hard to find in your drone. I mean, I, it's nothing particularly rare. And, uh, I mean, I go to Dr. Cranberry Grow's place, and it's a nice cranberry red color if you look at the right ones. And, um, you know, we, we got some of these, that, and, you know, of course, the our friends down in the USDA said it isn't possible that you have mites and that they're doing that kind of damage already. <laughs> well, I said, well, I really take offense to that. As anybody knows my personality, it really hasn't changed very much. <laughs> Anyways, so and somebody from Rhode Island says, what's a Varroa look like? And, and they, it was on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. It was great. So I went out to my hive, and 10 minutes later, I said, here, here's what they look like. Here, you take a digital camera, and you found it that quick, you've got them too. Just look at your drones. That's how big they are. Uh, you know, it, it's part of the game. So now, we got that. I'm going to talk about, let's, let's go again. Okay, let's go. We're going to talk about viruses next. Yes. So we 
Anybody remember there was a point we used to call this parasitic mite syndrome? I don't know how well you can see anyways, even with me in the way. Um, and this is what our hives look like in March. But there's still always a few alive, and you couldn't recover these. I don't care what you gave them, if you gave them any kind of antibiotic, legal, non-legal, or anything else, you couldn't do anything with them. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I'm, an, I'm an insect virologist by training in publication. And to me, this was looking more like viruses. So we called the USDA and says, could you test for viruses? No, we won't, because there isn't any in the United States. It's not a good thing to tell me. It's another thing not to do. Pete Wilson was working with me at the time, and, and, and now Carl, we, uh, my kind of said, no, this, these are viruses. How are we going to get them tested? Well, Pete Wilson's daughter had a very high position at Apple Computer, very, very high. And she actually worked in the Rothenstand area of England, where the top bee lab in the world is. She took a jaunt over there and said, hey, we've got some people who'd like to send you some bees. And, and, and you know, there's only two people that could sign them out of Massachusetts. It's myself and Al Cow. They didn't think they were millionaires. Al would do it, so they were watching me. <laughs> Bad mistake. <laughs> I covered for Al. These are some of the viruses we found. Uh, then, it's been some new ones coming in. This, you know, the, um, let me try to look at this. There, there's about 12 or 13 we found at that time. USDA pissed off with Al Carl. You have no idea. So the pressure started mounting around him. He was pushed to the side for a little while. Uh, conflict of interest charges, you know, the classic stuff. That, you know, they thought I would be better because the commissioner there really liked me a lot because I could talk. Yeah, I kind of shut. I wrote a new set. I'm the one that wrote those regulations you heard about now with a lawyer. And we basically held everything in place. And it didn't do any good. This, this is a clever parasite, it really is. So we got all these dead bees in the ground, we sent them in, and here's one of the reference, I got another letter at home where this is what the, I had a sample that I knew exactly how much row, how much trachomite there was in them, and that type of thing. This did not, they were not gonna ever talk about this as long as the earth existed, USDA. It just, nothing has changed, I don't think at all. But anyways, this, this, is, this is some of the letters, and people didn't, they got it, we had the letters. You know, back then, you couldn't email something, you had facts. Whoa, it was big time with a scientist from the old days. So we just, just learned some new, new things. So, in 2007, um, there was a virologist at UMass, and my daughter finished her master's about then, and she was, she was one of those people that could pull molecules apart and, and molecular DNA and RNA and stuff. And they said, well, how can we find some bees, Wayne? so we could test for viruses. And one of our committee members said, well, gee, that would be really hard. <laughs> so I started bringing them up to, to a group up there. John Moran was the one that, that, that I brought them up to. So we collected samples. You know, you see the sample nine. It was put together, too. It's a two-year high. These are some people who live near Cranberry Bogs in, um, in, in um, Freetown. And they had treated, you know, screen bottom bod, no varroa, no trachea I went through them. We had the queens. I wish they had tested them, but they never did. Uh, what we had collapsed in 2 8 completely. I found the queen. The virus is black queen cell deformed wing virus. That's probably the big one you're hearing so much about right now. And there's actually 36 genotypes now in the United States. This is stuff my daughter specializes in, it, but I know it as well. Uh, acute uh, Israeli acute paralysis virus came in from New Zealand. He lost his grant because of this. $175,000. I sat on a committee that had recommended him and I got bounced. Not that I got paid, but shot in my work day. Uh, and I was just even more pissed off than I was before. Uh, here's another one down in that area, same thing. Boom, 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 boom. We got some viruses here. Black queen cell, deformed wing, and, and such. So okay, here we go. This, this to me is the next, next big step. I mentioned it kind of. In 1990, we had a huge biological shift on Nosema. And so in Nosema, we went, we went to, and then, and, and, there was probably about 1960 in the Philippines, there was a jump of it from the Asian honeybee. And when we brought some of the, uh, our Italians back, they had it. It had spread across this fine. I was actually doing those type of samples in a lab at my house. And I noticed it shifted from brown to oval. But no one was talking about it yet. It wasn't until recently that the USDA, a bunch of us, had figured it out at that point. If I know more, my daughter would have done some molecular work before she went off in another direction. But, okay. So, we, we're down to almost the pesticide, down to the pesticide and sample of wax. Oh yeah, so this is, I got these out of order. Maybe I'll fix these, yeah, maybe I won't. Make me some change. This is Nosema, one, one with and one without. It's an intestinal parasite, and it's not one that belongs in our normal honeybee. Um, what can handle it? 
The Ponica bee, the bees from Sylvania, they don't have a problem. I'm going to talk a little bit more, but you can see it's a pretty good infection. And you notice all of a sudden, this was one from the mid early 90s and all of a sudden they're oval shaped. I got this off a of USDA site where they started talking about it. I went, well, isn't that interesting? Someone knew. They didn't have the molecular techniques to figure it out, but that's where we go. So, how much problem do you think this is? It was awful. This is, a, this is a plus one. You can get a few names. You can go look that one up. It's, it's free. You can go get this publication I have in my home. I can send it to you. And it's devastating what it did to the bees. Look, look at the damage in here. Look, look at, the, look at the, some of these curves. And this is incredible how much damage it's doing, and everybody knows this. Except everybody wants to do anything about it. And for me, now, this, this, this here was a, kind of an awakening for me. We also know when, when, when they get in there, the only thing that's really bad with, with some of the um, uh, Monsanto's uh, weed, weed killers is it messes around with this particular one. It makes it more intense. I was talking to beekeepers up in Vermont, and we, we were discussing one day, they were down in Bristol down here, they, they were asking me a thousand and one questions, and, and some, of the, I, some of the areas had problems. I said, well, is your corn till or no-till? And they went, no-till. Well, that means they spray to get rid of the weeds. Till means it's all right. And he went, you do know there's an association between, between this and, and, and any, any of the herbicides. He didn't move his bees out. And this is Vermont where he was having problems with Nosema. And the state there went around and that's how they found it. And that's a classic question I'll ask them, like, till or no-till. And Dighton has a lot of no-till. I don't know. I don't think I threw those in. So, here's one with some frippinils a slightly different class, but these two things are basically neonics. So there are publications on there. You say there's nothing that documents the fact that there's problems if you, if you, if you, if you use neonics, Nosema serrani gets worse. So now we have two steps that no one really wants to talk about. Well, no one. They do get, it's one of the reasons we're taping tonight, but anyways. Uh, it's not. So you see that. So right. does it suppress the immune system of the bee so that well, the nosema just runs rampant? That's what you suspect, or something else changes we don't understand. But there's no research on that. So I'm not going to come here and tell you something I haven't seen real research. I put the publications up. Don't we have people that kind of do stuff like that? You no. got to trust your universities. Yes, but that. their grant money is <laughs> dependent <laughs> on um, factors no that No comments out of me with a camera running. <laughs> They want their the grant money is contingent on um, factors that preclude them from um, following um, those pathways. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm here with the facts. <laughs> you know, I got the publication. Joe Friday. <laughs> Anyways, I'll write. Now we all know how Brother Adam brought. He did. He brought in all these different species, you know, subspecies down there, and some survived. Buck fast. And, and they always told us this, this was an acrine disease, this was a tracheomite disease. Well, the virologists, the people like my daughter that take this molecular stuff apart, not her, another lab went, went to museum specimens and looked to see what was in them. Serenia. That's what was in them. Amazing stuff. Um, I was, that was one that wasn't supposed to make it out to publication either. And I went, okay, how does this apply to Europe doing so much better? Fortunately, we had somebody traveling to Slovenia. Okay, so our bees are nosema intolerant, yet the Slovenia bees, which are required, which are conical, I'm going to show you the map in a minute. Now you know why our bees are getting darker. Yeah, because the genes from the darker Slovenian bee. Dark bees outnumber in New England and that. Now I have some discussions with people from Florida that go, well, the bees went to better down there. Well, no kidding. My dark bees made it really well. The dark bees do extremely well. So I'm pointing at people in directions. You can make your own choices. You can call me a crackpot and move, move on and move on to the next step. Where did okay. you get your dark bees from, Chuck? In, in, well, you can get them anywhere, anywhere, anywhere you want. No, I got eaten. I got I know you are. I, you know, you're how well they went during the only question I've got. I mean, but we're going to talk, what's talking, what's okay, going on? Let me do my whole talk. Yeah, then, we can, then we can have a discussion, yeah. I think. So, <laughs> mellifera is the German black bee. It's mellifera, mellifera. Okay? Caucasian bee in Russian, the Russian bee's Caucasian. The mellifera, Caucasian, right? Uh, this one here is the Italian bee. Now, notice the conica, where it is, and why they're keeping that strain so pure. Why their bees aren't dying. They use pesticides different than us, and different pesticides, and they've done a really good job of 
bringing stuff back for me to me to look at. You know, it's a different different mindset over there. Now, those who don't know, who she runs a uh, uh, Facebook site called AZ Hybers. We have over a thousand people I communicate almost continuously with in other languages about what's going on and what they're using. Different characters I can't read. It comes back close enough you can figure it out. It, I don't know of any place else where it has an international group where we're public enemies with half the people on that, where we're actually all enjoying talking about bees. And everybody's polite and nice and, you know, well, what are you doing over there? Well, how much pesticide do you use where you are? What's going on? And she's got, she get her back here. She, she speaks down crystal quite a bit. But she, uh, she's got some really great, great slides uh, on the Slovenian stuff. This is the Africanized bee right here. This one with the S. This is the one who's trying to breed these two together in, in South America and got loose. He was trying to put those two together and produce a hybrid. That's what he was really trying to do. So I'll throw that in. Why didn't he do the hybridization over in Africa rather than take them over to South America to do it? Where would you rather be, South America or Africa? You get malaria in Africa, you just get Zika in, in, in there now. <laughs> well, as long as you don't get pregnant, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I can't be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I like to fill in the blanks. But not today. That's, a, that's a different hybrid, I suppose. Well, I suspect that's a different hybrid, I suppose. <laughs> well, what do we do at Bristol? I said, okay, what do I notice what's happening? People that are feeding honeybee healthy are doing better. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, good stuff. You've got probably a lot of people who use it and have a lot of success. Well, you mix this. With living grass, and, and most people mix their own from their own essential oils. They put it in a blender, da 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 da, and they put it in. My bees just got all this now. I know my bees do better. I can actually look for no samer and stuff. So my suggestion is get honeybee healthy, and you don't even have to mix it yourself. Follow the label and add it to your familiar bee. We're wrapping Nothing. it off tonight. Pardon? We're wrapping some off tonight. Raffling. I have plenty, but uh, now we, we maybe you can <laughs> split it. And put, you, know, you don't need a lot. So you could actually each take like 100 milliliters or something, but you don't have, it's, you know, I don't, my in, my indoor observation hives are getting it now, not my outdoor hives, because I don't even want that much moisture in my, as you're talking right now in my hives, and, you know, I throw it in other ways. I have a lot of indoor observation hives. They always make it. I mix it a little bit with fondant. Uh, uh, and, and, and I actually take the oil. And then yeah. mix it into That's mine, right. and I don't heat it. And I add probiotics with uh, tea yogurt tea oil too. No, I, I actually used the one that um, Noah Wilson Rich spoke about. I was at the meeting down here. Well, he and I started sharing information, which I think is a wonderful guy because we actually share useful information with each other. And he, the one they worked with, and then I went into the patent law and said, "Look and see what everybody's working with." And I used the one most of the researchers work with. So I'm going to explain a little bit here about bee immunity works. It's, it's really, I learned this from him. It's nothing I do on my own. And basically, if you get a, a bacillus, and loosely saying, I'm going to say American fowl brood is bacillus. Yeah. And a type anyway, it's a subtype. But if you take something like bacillus subtilis, which, which is a ground bacteria, you know, simple, we eat it every day in our food. It's one of those things that's in the probiotics. So if you give that type of probiotic to a honeybee, well, they're, they're not, their immune system's not as good. So if you give them bacillus subtilis, it takes all the bacillus up, including the fowl brood. Yeah. That is the theory behind it in honeybees. They don't have, we have the ability to selectively pick things out. And that's why that works so well. If you want to know why we're doing so well in Bristol County, I can tell you some of the reasons. This stuff's cheap. I mean, most of us are sick. We put it on, a lot of us snuck, snuck it into our sugar on the top now. Because um, if you've got, you got no semen, it's gone. When you mix that with the seed, it's just gone. So anyways. Okay, alcohol. I don't know which one. Yeah, it's probably the alcohol. Yeah, yeah, it's the other one. Uh, this is alcohol. This is um, some migratory bees in, 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 in 1990. Yeah, they all know. If you hear Al and I, if you ever heard the stories, mm. the bees were Africanized. Unfreaking believable. You wonder how these new diseases chased this stuff in in 1990 from South America and, and up here. Uh, so, you know, people tell me how awful they, you know, the migratory bees are not that bad. Unfortunately, they brought a lot of row off in 1988, but they're not that bad. And only one guy did at the time. And now wearing gloves, you know the bees are bad. You see all that? That's not dust in the air. You can't even talk. It's just like you hear in the pictures. And they don't do well in the winter up here, and then they move on. Doing some more surveillance is how we knew it. It moved two miles in the, in the first year. Uh, that's my house, which is about five miles from the air, and my bees are all dead almost immediately. So we didn't have any idea how to sample these things. You know, no one's ever worked with them before. 
And so, so you know, this, this right here is, you know, you know, star fluid, ether, you put some in it, but people shake it up, they all stick to the sides. Yep. You know, it's a stinky mess, but you know, I, th I think Dawn and her shaking and it's it swept them down a little bit better. Because I do a lot of mic counts. Uh, we, we use a technique we call scratch and smash. I don't know where that one went, but that's right back. Yeah, that's kind of hard to come down. The, um, so you, we feel a little square, smash it out with scratcher. And we get, well, USDA assured us that we were lying about the numbers we were seeing. You know, I wish I had the ability to send stuff and put it on the internet I do today when someone says that to me. But anyways, uh, there's, there's that. So let's talk about how pesticides, and I did a study, and actually I've, I've actually presented this whole study to internationally, never mind nationally, uh, looking at mosquito control in that. And here we got, here we got some, I don't care for it, fine. You can look ahead at the next slide. Um, so there's bees dying in my area. Hmm, I don't know why, but anyways, I kind of go, huh, and I, I got a study going on now, where I count them every morning before the birds can eat them. And yeah, that's gonna look pretty peculiar, but anyways. So we go here, and this is my study design. I went out every morning, and then after the fact, so I could hear the mosquito control, they allowed to go by my house. My highs are about 175th Ninja Road, and these are all the mosquito control sprays. And one right here, and we have this huge, huge jump. So I call my friend down the road, and here they are spraying corn. Linate and wire mix. Two restricted use pesticides, just as my bees are getting on corn. All my neighbor's bees are dying. Now, how well do you think I took that? Not well? Not well. <laughs> it's really, really bad right now. Probably invited them all over. I, 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 have, I have kind of held some of these slides back. I haven't shown them publicly. Well, <laughs> the pink tapes. <laughs> that is corn. It all tassel. They're working it. They're running it. And they, they collect it for the fat. You know, all they need to do is follow some of the laws that are in place in the Midwestern states and just do it late in the afternoon. Interesting. Simple. Well, you just weren't going to listen to me. Well, well anyways, um, 2.9 miles from my house. My house is here. Spray area there. And I got another farm right here. That's the guy that got me the last time that really pissed me off. So what do you think they do with the extra spray? Let's just go spray the weeds around the edge of the corn and all the other stuff because we got to empty our hoppers. A friend got a picture of that. These bees have been killed as long as my end was right here. That's what they're doing. They get a left over to put it on the weeds. Now tell me, this: the label is clear. You can't spray when pollinators are present. Label on this is clear. I fired it off at the legislature. I'm not talking about that right now. And this has been going on with me for a few years. It's just getting worse. So that's what they did. So I made the front page of the paper. Well, there's clipping agencies. The head of the EPA for... This type of thing called me at my home. He got my telephone number and said, what in the hell's going on down there? And I said, well, you can see it. They mixed two chemicals together and they killed a lot of bees. And he said, well, you, you know, uh, he'd certainly like all the people to report it to him. So we did the forms because Massachusetts doesn't tell anybody that they have because of the federal level. Now, how do I know that? I did a Freedom of Information Act with Peer, who's in my local area. Yeah, they, they don't. But they're not the only state that does it. So how are we going to get the federal government to sit back and help us with problems if the states are not reporting it. I'm not getting into the testing techniques and how pathetic they are, but that, that's the thing. We've already talked about that. Okay, you want to see something really depressing? No. Well, you're going to get it anyways. <laughs> I got to get more attention. So what this, what this is, and this is, this is the USDA published record, peer reviewed. You can go get it yourself. You can go search it out and read it through. Where they, where they found 121 different pesticides is an 887 facts found in hive samples. That's a lot of pet different pesticides. USDA has this information. They don't release it anymore. As a matter of fact, what they do, did is Pierre had to represent somebody that they said, you're not going to publish this anymore, and the judge is giving a green light on that. So our comb is more or less. Oh, no, it's not more no. or less. I got that slide coming. No, it was. They're it no, was. There those no pest strips. Remember those? Oh, they probably wouldn't. Yeah, they're pretty bad. I'll talk about that. So here we got this 121 different pesticides, and um, I don't need to talk about that again. And this one is in wax samples out of the hives. Now these are three big migratory beekeepers, and I am not picking on them. It is not the purpose of this. The fact is, they got bees going all over the country, but not the Midwest, which is where most of the neonics are used on corn up there. But you can see the top 10, 15 are all chemicals beekeepers have put in. 
Actually, some of them I was trying to figure out, and I said, oh, that's for treating, treating those some of the same or Maybe they brought from somebody else's hives. <coughs> so this is kind of very damaging, I, I think. Pollen and bee samples, there's still 749 wax samples. These, these are really, you know, not even pots per billion, they're pots per 100,000, it's really incredible. Um, you wanna know what's in your foundation? Ah, I forgot how many hundreds different things, but remember we had the big die off, 2010? Remember what everybody put, and the bees would die, leave all the foundation not drawn out? That's why. So we're getting by that now, it's no, most people are using top bar. Yeah. That's the reason. Most of us at that point went, huh? And you know, as I, as I said, I you know we retired in 2011, and this publication came out about the time I retired. And this is one of the things I actually decided to look at a little bit closer. But you can't get anybody to test, not in Massachusetts. You not say in most of us now are using top bar. No, a lot of the people then no, went no. to top bar for that reason, so they they could get clean and frown found. They, somebody knew something was wrong with the foundation and didn't know why. Well, what happened is once the beekeepers found it, or the big beekeepers. They just sold it to the foundation companies. Do I need to complete that sentence? A lot of people knew. I immediately started going, something in this wax. I mean, I had a lot of old wax, so I'd set up a hive with pre-1985 wax, put it side by side. They wouldn't draw the new wax, and they draw my old wax up. I had a bunch, in, and I use mostly plastic frame now, so I can take my own wax and paint it. And that's eliminated problem, but it's not as bad as it was. Um, it, it's really cleaned up a little. Why aren't they testing it? I don't know. Corn bar, that's what it looks like, and that's what they're spraying all the corn for. Um, Native people in my area didn't like the concept that the, that the, the guy in Dighton then killed my bees <laughs> with lanate and warrior. And funny thing is, I'll talk about it in a minute, my only ones that come up positive is I told them I'd sent it out for testing and they know who I am. Hmm. Well, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let's go back to that. That, that they, you might know why they got the path down the corn rows? Well, I gave this a couple nights ago, everybody knew. Uh, you guys are not farmers down here, up here. <laughs> but they yeah, put the right. booms and spray it all out. I got friends that lost bees there, I got their, their reports as well. And this is um, Swansea's friend. She lost that, uh, that hive. That's what a bee kill looks like. And they didn't find any pesticides in that at all. Really? Really? I'm going to talk about a miracle in a minute. <laughs> and those are my bees doing this. Find a video. You can watch them dying. I mean, it's really. So, there's a miracle occurred in Rhode Island. It really, it really a miracle, sarcastically said. And I live here. So we had in another friend lived here, and we, we got blasted pretty good, and the corn spray was the one I showed you about 2.9 miles away. Um, now I get hit with another one the following year where the farmer right there hit me with some spray, and that was, that was that went in the papers. That that was, I'd had enough. Bill, no one would buy from him anymore, any of his vegetables. So he's no longer in business. <coughs> That's what they happened to Dighton. His kids don't want it. Okay, here's the Rhode Island line, okay? See, see the ones in Massachusetts, no pesticides. See the one in Rhode Island. Rhode Island has found pesticides. Two Lambus Ihalothrens. One we know is Warrior, and because they went out to a private lab. Huh? Isn't that interesting? Well, I never really released that information till tonight, so <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Me. And I do have a lot of observation hives in my house. They do very well indoors, and I, I got many different kinds. So and that's why I keep that, my good queens. What? You're saying um, they did the same test just over the border at Rhode Island? Oh, yeah. It came yeah. up with completely different results? Yeah. Is that what you're trying yeah. to say? Yeah, none compared to a bunch. <laughs> Wait a minute. Somebody could actually test and come up, conclude that there was none. I have the lab sheets in my hands. In writing. I in writing. And a mile and a mile uh, west or yeah. whatever it is. In Rhode Island, they yeah. tested positive. And found it. Yeah. Now, the farmer down there got fined. What's so up with loss that? Loss of license. <laughs> shut him down. And there's no corn down there now, in that area. People go, my bees are still alive. So this is what I've been doing for the past five years. Now I'm now I'm talking about. I love observation hives because I can keep different kinds of um, queens in them. Massachusetts. That's right. Okay. I, a lot of people probably know that, that myself, Lucy Tabin, and Lost Beast, spoke at an environmental group up in Northeastern this past Sunday. If you didn't, you probably caught our names talking about So we both, and I asked these, uh, this is my thing, they're really hardcore green people. I mean, it was really, for us to even be speaking there was amazing. And place, our, our talks are packed and, and, and stuff. But I asked, I asked another question. Does anybody really know what ended DDT in the United States? I'm old enough to know what happened. You can even begin to speculate. 
Oh, when it's that hawk hurting the eagles. bald eagles and everything like that? Actually, that pro pro problem may not be true. It's worse than that. Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson, indeed, was probably behind it. It was her book that did that. No doubt in my mind, we need another one of those. So what, what really happened was the, the ability to test at lower levels came out about that time, from parts per thousand to parts per million. They found it in everything. The federal government didn't like that. It was all your foods, everything, and that just killed it federally. Simple. So, so, so we don't, sold don't. it overseas. They killed it in the United States. But we sold it overseas. We still made yeah, it. Right? Yeah, but the manufacturing level is really, if you look at a real white really distribution, dropped. it really dropped. And then we, you know, then we the went into the things in 1967 that just killed my piece two years ago. Land 8 Warrior and I, an old class, class of pesticides. Uh, I think you probably know about neonicotinoids here. It's, it's basically a man-made nicotine, yeah. artificial. I don't know why people don't mix it with straw and smoke it or something, because they probably <laughs> do the same thing. Now, the neonicotinoids, the, 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 there's a lot of different nicotines that are in, in some of the essential oils that are really protective to bees, really help um, with some of the nocema problems, and some of them really help bumblebees as well. And it's a bunch of you know, people like you that got me going on, these natural path type people, and I said, okay, I'm going to look at this. And some of the great, the only thing I put bring the publications in my class when we talk about them, is sustainable agriculture down there. And the Pollination Protection Plan, and, and um, anybody knows I don't really care for it that much. And, you know, it seems like a, a not very much too late. There's no one listening to anything. All this has been available to people since 1988. Right now, all of a sudden, I can tell you why, I'm not going to tell you in tape. And, uh, and stuff, <laughs> to probably tell you at some point too. And um, I'm amazed, I'm just amazed that, that I just don't see how it can help at all. These are the problems, we're, strong, we're gonna have to fix them ourselves. We've used some of these, these type of mixtures, and a lot of people up here, I'm sure, use them too. These, these are not mind-boggling concepts of using essential oils, honeybee healthy, which is two essential oils. Um, it's lemongrass in any of the mints, but it's spearmint. And it's those two of the lemon two that are in there. Spearmint kills them. And lemon, lemongrass is a, um, they found it in the trees. And lemongrass is, is identical to the queen, one of the queen substances the bees are attracted to. So why do you think a lendon would put, put out that material in the two materials in their tree? Why? And I used to think trees put essential oils out to kill things that are coming near it. No. They're making those things to keep the bees healthy so that they don't pollinate them for every year. And they're rewarding with honey, it's in the honey, and, and this, some of the stuff is being shown, you know, at least my, 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 my crystal and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the folks with those, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so it's symbiotic relationship. It probably is, and, and stuff. Natural and, selection, the favorite. And, and, and there's a lot of interesting, the people at UMass Amherst, they just had a publication about two years ago, it was fantastic, because they were looking at some of the breakdown of different products, they found some of the nicotines and that, nicotine, real nicotine. In a lot of beekeepers years ago, there's a, I haven't been able to find that particular uh, tobacco product yet, but there's a particular product that I have to grow it, that they, you see them smoking in those old old things and Facebook people put, well they're smoking that particular tobacco blown in the bees and it may be therapeutic to the bees during that era. It, but it's a slightly different that people smoked back then. And I don't remember the name of it now. When I was down south last time, I tried to find some in all the, all the tobacco stores. So I'm going to have to grow it probably if I wanted to play around and see what it does. But We used to use chewing tobacco. It probably is in that as, group. As um, a, a, a pesticide, bactericide. Well, there was... Um, That's why the now now you're trying to get me to remember the old name. There, there was um, nicotine sulfate. Funny, all of a sudden, they got rid of that just before the neonics were coming in. I always found that coincidental. Just coincidence. I, I don't know. You know, I'm just an entomologist. That just a country boy. I'm just a country boy. Live down Dighton. That, that's all. I mean, I'm just a country boy. I don't, 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 don't know. You know, I, 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 I blame it all on. I was raised southern in New England. My, my mother came out of the Ozark Mountains and married during the war. When I came and moved into New England, where my father lived and. My yeah, father was from South County, Rhode Island. I you got six fingers. Let me see. Um, I can toast, toast. I won't show you those. But anyway, so um, I can I can get talking to Southern. I can come back really, really quick. But it's funny. Um, but anyways, that's what I spent the last five years doing. And getting it on tape. <laughs> now, anybody dares ask questions while while she's taping? I don't know. Okay. Are you conclusion? I think if I, we're doing better. If you're looking at using some of these essential oils and what you're going after, 
You know, think of the viruses you can't, so you're gonna have to definitely do something about the mites. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. We've got two new products now. We, we like got oxalic. And I'm sure no one in here, I was joking last night, I said, how many burners are out there in this room? 50? <laughs> but, you know. Burners. <laughs> burners. Yeah, please. It's like a bong. <laughs> don't breathe. I mean, I can tell people that. Well, I, don't, don't, I mean, I know a lot of people use it, and those people do it very successful with the bees. But it's here. I've been nagging and nagging and nagging, and then I started going to the Master Department of Agriculture meetings and nagging even more. And who knows why? And, and, and we also got um, uh, hop guard. Hop guard. And hop guard is, is made from hops. And hops are naturally pesticide. It's probably the greener product as you can get. You put two strips in each high, and make sure that, that you know it, that that label's simple. You can actually keep that. Even you mean queen breeders keep it in their hives, and they chew it out. So you don't have to go back and get it out like a lot of the other stuff. Oxalic, I'm a, I'm a, I would prefer the dribble. I think it's safer and it works very well. But that's you can read the label. If you want the label, I can send it to whoever sends stuff out, or maybe I could post it. I know. Um, I know. It, I spoke last night about it. It's going out to all the Bristol people with labels. Yep. So which grow treatment do you think is best? I think they both work. For me. Well, there are others. Um, I think I've been doing very well with formic in the month of August. But it kills a lot of bees, and I suspect those are virally infected bees that are dying. You get a pretty good die off. I understand, but you, know, you don't get a big die off from farming in August. People right. lose their queens with formic acid too. That's why my that's why my percent went up on my and, and, and why I got so much honey. I'm not dealing with it. Just taking all the honey off. That's why my percent went up. You know, I lost a queen, but you did. I mean, oxalic's not as bad. Um, it's been legal in Rhode Island for a while. I've been teaching it because I teach it down at Fall River. You got both Rhode Islanders and people from Massachusetts. And the glass is there. So I could teach that part of it, but have the demo on. And the formic acid, the mitoway quick strips, I, I don't know what it is because I'm with the QRI and yeah. we, a few years ago, couldn't believe how many people in the month of August they were using MAQS in August. Hot. You gotta choose your weather ahead of time. You're looking at the weather for three or four days. You try to choose a cool, not a hot spell. That's the way you want to go. Yeah. I would, you know, dribble, dribbles, I actually wrote to you one day. Dribble, IA is totally different. And, and they call it sprinkle. Uh, it's very easy Tinkle. to do. Sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle. <laughs> and um, it's. Um, when do you do that? When do you. Um, I don't know yet. Um, um, they say do it in December, but there's plenty of people that do it every seven days for a month that had during the summer. Remember Finsky on Bee Master? Finsky yeah. from Finland? Yeah. He was a big proponent of the dribble in, in December. Oh, it was worked well. But 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 people the people here are formic acid. Yeah, it, but, acid. Yeah. Yeah. Oxalic, yeah. But but people deck that didn't have the burners we had made with hot plugs and everything else. But you get it too hot and it's supple and so and for, uh, formic acid. Mm -hmm. Uh, not for me, formaldehyde, formaldehyde, excuse me, formaldehyde, if you don't use it right. So, well, I'm going to be preparing a whole series on that, but it just got, I did not expect it to pass two weeks ago. I think that it would happen in July. Yeah, anyway. This is very difficult. If you're going to use you need to be group Well, that's why a lot of people do it every seven days for four months. Yeah. For four weeks. Dribble. Dribble. Good. At least three times. At least three to fourth really does it. To get uh, the cells that And that's hurt. not contrary to label. The label has no definition of how frequently you can do it in. There's suggestions, but not, not, not in the label. Yeah, because it doesn't make it past the wax barrier into the cells right. that are capped. Right. Do you have an opinion on thymol? Uh, I would rather use formic than thymol. Thymol gives you honey of flavor. Um, and it sometimes hasn't work, worked for me when I've worked with it, so I tended to go with you know, the base, the formic base. Uh, I probably won't go back to that, because you know, let's face it, you can get enough to treat 40 highs for 11 bucks, but you you're supposed to use, the law says you're supposed to use the one you buy from Brushy, because they're responsible for the quality control that you buy. Get it where you want, I'm telling you what the law says. And that's plenty enough, the label's very clear on how to mix it, it's simple and everything else. So I, I treated in November with the dribble method, yep. with the, uh, the yep. silic acid, and I still lost a very strong high with what I was okay. discussing. So okay, let, me, let, let me we'll talk what I speculated happened. Okay. Insect viruses, in particular, change the behavior of their host. Now, we had a very warm, warm year, and we had a lot of bees, drones, leaving the hives 
And I still had drones go right through the winter this year. And the drones were leaving. And I had a very good beekeeper down there that were doing weekly counts. And she got this big spike. And I kept asking, what are the numbers? What are the numbers? They had come in probably with a virus. Uh, the pop, uh, another group, I'm not going to get into who it is, we have virus studies going on now. I sampled mostly Plymouth County because you guys are getting the huge die out. I got one or two in Bristol, but I have some samples coming out of here. I expect those. No one knows where they are. The two of us do. They were. Yeah. So. Yeah. Time for. Let's go. You can go drink. I, I can talk just as well with coffee in my hand. Then I'm up all night. Let's take a break. Uh, we've got uh, refreshments.